Driving at Home with ABOR's Housing Economist, Claire Losey. All right, everybody, we are back again with this week's Driving at Home podcast with Dr. Claire Losey. I am Kalea Youngblood, your Chief Marketing Officer here at the Austin Board of Realtors. Claire, thanks for joining us again today. Thanks so much for having me. We're going to talk about some fun stuff today. We're going to jump into uh, personal consumption expenditures, the Austin labor market, and then, of course, our weekly stats. So why don't we kick it off with the labor market data for uh, what was recently released here in Austin? Absolutely. So we just received our August labor market data for the MSA. And essentially, overall, we saw the total non-farm jobs grew about 2.4% on a year-over-year basis. That's slightly lower than what we saw for the state as a whole at about 2.8%. However, Austin did lead the U.S.'s rate, which was about 2%. So in essence, you know, moderate, moderate job growth. It's certainly slowed since over the past several months, since we're kind of normalizing post-pandemic, right? We had that initial wake as we were recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic to add more jobs, add those jobs that we had lost. But now we're entering a more normalized um, job market. What we really saw with respect to the different industries is that mining, logging, and construction led the pack with a year-over-year increase of 6.7%. So think of all the rock quarries and just the mining that the Hill Country offers and the growth of those sorts of industries. Manufacturing grew 3.4%, professional and business services was up about 3.7%, and leisure and hospitality was up 5.3%. The industries that lagged with respect to growth were information, very modest growth at 0.2%, and then financial activities, again, very modest growth at 0.1%. With respect to information, of course, we've just seen Overall, some moderation right in that industry with respect to growth, just more conservative measures around growth in the information sector, just given the hits that tech took, and especially in 2022. And then financial activities, of course, all of the ripple effects from the banking crisis earlier this year, and of course, just concerns over the uncertainty of financial markets moving forward as the Fed continues to process inflation and price that into the Fed funds rate. So overall, the Austin labor market looks fairly well positioned, not as strong of growth as we've seen in prior months, but again, leading leading that of the U.S. That's great news for um, construction though, right? With the quarries kind of back up and running and some of the manufacturing back up and running. So that's that's definitely a positive with regards to new home construction and housing in general. So I'm pleased exactly. to hear that for sure. Yeah. Now let's give us a rundown on personal consumption. Last Friday, personal consumption expenditures data was released. Can you talk about why this measure is important and what it means to the Federal Reserve and how markets reacted to it? Absolutely. So the personal consumption expenditures price index, I know that's that's a, a hefty phrase, so we just call it PCE. It's the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, and it's just the value of goods and services that are purchased by or on behalf of people who live in the U.S. So it's very similar in nature to the consumer price index or the CPI, which we're all familiar with. However, the difference is that the measures use different formulas and weights to calculate inflation, and they differ slightly just with respect to the items that they're using to calculate inflation. Essentially, what we saw with the price index is that it rose 0.4% on a month-over-month basis in August, which was in line with what economists had been expecting. And then excluding those more volatile categories of food and energy, the PCE index increased 0.1%, which actually fell below forecasts. So overall, positive news on that front when accounting for just core PCE, which again is extracting those more volatile food and energy categories on a year-over-year basis, 
the index measured 3.9%, which fell in line with consensus expectations, but was this a smaller increase than we have been seeing. And then the monthly increase, that 0.1%, that's the smallest monthly increase we've seen since November of 2020. So certainly good news on that front. And I should say too, that the PCE index, it's considered particularly valuable because it does account for changes in consumer behavior. So for example, Consumers may choose to substitute lower cost goods for more expensive items when the prices of items are increasing, i.e. when we're under higher inflation. So the PCE provides just a better cost of living snapshot than the more popular consumer price index. So with respect to how markets reacted to the PCE, Overall, again, it was positive news, and the market-based probabilities for future rate hikes were down following the release of the report on Friday. So right now, according to this widely used tracker by the CME group, which essentially provides probabilities of future rate hikes by the Federal Reserve, traders are essentially assigning about a 15% probability for a rate increase in November, in the Fed's November meeting, which is down about half from just a week ago. And then the probability that traders are pricing in that the Fed will hike rates in December fell to about one third compared to a little over 40% a week ago. So in essence, what's happening is that investors are seeing that the more favorable data may actually indicate that the Federal Reserve does not need to induce that 25 basis point rate hike that had previously been expected to happen in either the November or the December meeting. So we'll be keeping an eye on that for sure. When do you think that we'll know what they're planning to do? And will you be following this as a tracker to predict whether the Federal Reserve will raise rates or not? Absolutely. So two thoughts on that. The Fed has indicated again and again over the past several months, even a couple of years now, that they're very data dependent. We've heard that phrase over and over again. And so they're really going to be waiting for the release of the September CPI data, which will happen in just a couple of weeks. They're really going to be waiting for the release of that to really inform their decisions. And two, I should say that the ADP employment data is coming out. It's being released this week. So... It's really too early to tell, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that whether, you know, whether the Fed will actually end up choosing to raise rates either in its November or December meeting. My guess is that if we do see a rate hike, it would be more likely to happen actually in November than it would in December, just because the Fed has indicated they want to kind of get ahead of the curve and want to raise rates sooner and then, you know, potentially end up in a scenario where they're mitigating inflationary effects more quickly. But again, it's just it's just going to depend on the data and they may actually be able to prolong any sort of potential rate hike from November to December or even further if the data continues to be favorable, like what we saw last Friday with the PC price index. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's turn it inward and let's talk about our weekly stats. I know that's what everybody really wants to know. Give us the headlines for the week and what we can tell our clients. So overall, it was a strong week. I should start this really with a caveat that we tend to see that the last week in any given month is stronger with respect to sales and leasing activity. There's just kind of that end of month push to close out the deals. So what we saw last week is that sales increased by about 50%, which of course is a big number. But we had also, too, it's important to remember, we'd been down on on sales activity for the past couple of weeks. And then with respect to leasing, closed leases were up about 41%. So again, you know, a significant increase on a week over week basis. Meanwhile, pending sales were down about 13%. Pending leases were up about 12%. 
But on both fronts, active listings were down very modestly between about 1% and 2%, depending on whether it was sales or, or leasing activity. So overall, I would say that we're still fairly well positioned, especially with respect to where mortgage rates stand. Of course, the 10-year treasury yield remains elevated, which means that mortgage rates are continu- going to continue to remain elevated. So overall, the market is performing fairly well. And of course, we'll see our September stats in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Well, thanks for that. I I think this was a good sort of positive week with regards to what we're looking at and the numbers. Um, I want to remind everybody that we did release a buy versus rent index that Claire, Dr. Lissy had um, published for us. Very interesting stats on um, buying versus renting and the historical and future predictions of that. You should share that with your clients. Uh, We'll link to it here in in the transcript for the the podcast today. And then also don't forget on October 10th, we're having a market shift conversations again. Um, We're going to have Avis Wukash uh, give us a little bit of information on the buyer's representation agreement, along with some peer-to-peer talks on how to overcome some of those objections with regards to ensuring that you're having the the good conversation with your clients on the buyer's rep agreement. So come see us on October 10th. You can find that on awar.com to register. Thanks so much, Dr. Losey, for joining us again today. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Take care.